Our next speaker is Dr. Steve Teramath, who is the Chief Base Realignments and Closure Program, uh, Chief of the Base Realignments and Closure Program Division. Thank you. Uh, just whatever that meant in terms of what we do, bottom line is got responsibility for any closed installations across the country. And in the case of BRAC, the base realignment closure of which Fort Smith is one of them, that means we've got 40 of those locations across the country. So uh, I'm just kind of the, uh, I don't know, the put you to sleep guy before the part you're interested in, and that's when my other folks are going to talk about the specifics of Wordsmith and what they found. Got it? Is this better? My apologies. Okay now? I guess I'd say raise your hand if you can't hear me, but if you can't hear me, you don't know to raise your hand. <laughs> okay. The, the, the main thing I want to first of all say is whenever we close an installation, just because the installation's been closed, the property's transferred, therefore still has that commit to fulfill its requirements and to fulfill its commitments to, as you see here, address contamination that was caused by the Air Force during the time we were at that base. We're going to continue to come back. We will continue to follow through. And you'll see that, that we have been for the contamination. And PFCs is no different on that. You have our commitment to, to do what's appropriate and proper up here. We're also uh, uh, conducting a program you're going to see. There's progress being made. We're doing a lot of what you heard DQ, DQ ask of. We're delineating. We're looking at that contamination. But most importantly, our overall policy within the Air Force, not just here at Wordsmith, but it applies obviously here at Wordsmith, is that we have an ongoing effort. And that ongoing effort means that if any time we, the Air Force, <clears throat> find that there's been a, a PFC release and that we have a basis for believing there's the potential for that to have exposed someone through their drinking water, and we're going to remove or commit to taking care of any unacceptable risk. And in this case, unacceptable risk that you've heard is defined at least by, within our authority's capability is that provisional health advisory defines that level that the Air Force is working with right now. And so what is our program that we're doing? First of all, we've gone through Wordsmith that you're going to hear about, that there are some locations where we have defined that. The sampling that we did at the uh, water wells and everything was a result that there was a determination or evaluation that says there is the potential for contamination in those wells. And we responded accordingly for that. And whenever we have those, we're going to take action whenever it's above that provisional health advisory. Now, I've already got everybody's attention now. That isn't what Christina and some of the others have said with regard to what you should be doing. And that's what's caused a dilemma. And it's a dilemma for you. It's a dilemma for your health professionals here within the state. It's a dilemma for the Air Force. It's a dilemma for the DEQ. What do I mean by that dilemma? As we look out there, within the law, you heard that we referred to the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Under the law that was passed that governs our response actions, we are bound that they provide the health information and the health impact information. And right now, that agency that also advises EPA has not found that there is some consistency within the health effects or consensus. The, the studies so far sometimes conflict with each other, and it hasn't led to that. So you end up with only this provisional health advisory is the only number we have out there by which to judge things. The other thing when you talk about ATSDR is working here with your HHS group here on that health consultation you heard reference from on the fish. They'll continue to work with all the communities that we have those engagements and the Air Force actually funds them to do that. So where I'm headed on all this is there's a dilemma out there because you've heard the term emerging contaminants. 
PFC is an emerging contaminant. What does that mean? It means it's a contaminant that we think is a problem, we think it's going to be a problem, and it's unlike any emerging contaminant that I have ever dealt with in my career. What do I mean by that? Almost any time there's an emerging contaminant, there is consensus, there is a belief that there is a particular health impact, and usually everybody by this time is just trying to refine that number that it's supposed to be acceptable for. Without that consensus, we're all in that dilemma of what is that level that should be reasonable for all of us to feel good about. I, I truly empathize with you, the public. I, I like to think of myself sometimes as the public too, because you want answers. And unfortunately, all of us don't have definitive answers for you. And for that, it has caused a problem. It's the reason all of you are here. You want answers. We don't have all the answers. The Air Force is not in the health business. We rely on other people to advise us on what we have to do. So what it is is when we ask for authority from Congress to spend money, one of the things they ask us is, is there a, reg a law or regulation that tells you that you need to do something or how you do it? And we have to be able to say yes when we ask for the money or they don't give it to us, so to speak, for that thing. And right now, the absence of, of anything other than the provisional health advisory, which is treated as a regulation, we don't have the, all the authorities that we need to be able to respond to that, okay? I'm not giving you the answers you wanted to hear, and I would love to be able to stand here and say we know what we're gonna do and that. But in this, the rest of the presentation, you're going to see that we're not just sitting on our hands waiting for a number. We are going out there, like I said, we're identifying those sources, we're looking, to where the, looking at the hydrology that says where is that contamination going. We're taking the action such as the fish advisory. When that went out, we put a system in there to intercept and to prevent further contamination of going to Clocks Marsh. We will continue to protect the public health to the best of our abilities that we have within the authorities of the appropriate laws that apply. And I apologize for... Uh, talking in, in the bureauc bureaucratic part, and I hope the rest will be more interesting with that. Yes, sir. So if I make a law, you're going to abide by it? Absolutely. If, if the state makes a law, you will abide by that state law? Correct. Awesome. I'll start working on that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. If everyone didn't hear that, the question is, did the Air Force not hook up people to did municipal? Did they hook them up to city water on F-41? I'm sorry? They, they did, yes. Did they hook them up to city water on F-41? They did, yes. Yes. No, I live on F-41. I don't know the, the full okay. length of it, but yes. We're the Air Force base. We built our house in 97. We went to Tawas to get a permit. They gave me a permit to put a well in. Why didn't they tell me to put city water? So now I already got a well. Now I have to be hooked up to city water because my well was tested. And so we cannot drink the water. I, I can't speak to why you were allowed to have a public well versus the other because we don't obviously give out the permits for, for wells. Okay, Steve, if, if you don't mind me taking that question. Yes, the Air Force did provide that city water back in the early 90s. And that was when the environmental program was kind of in its infancy. infancy. And uh, they had found contaminants on the base that were above criteria. They were criteria for safe drinking water. And the Air Force went proactively onto F-41, picked up the water line where it currently ended, which was right around the uh, Party and Food Center. Took it north, all the way up to uh, the DNR field office. Now, after, yep, and after the fact, the Air Force spent many dollars and a lot of time characterizing where all those groundwater plumes were at and determine which ones 
were contained within the base, which ones moved off. And then your house apparently was in an area where it hadn't moved off base. In fact, most of the areas, uh, those contaminant plumes did get off the base because the systems were in place capturing that. So the, DA, the Department of Public Health, which is in communication with us regularly, is advised of where those plumes exist, where they don't. So that's probably why they issued you the permit to install the uh, well. But then when I went to get my water tested after we moved up here, because I thought I'm going to go get my water tested. In Tawas, they told me that I, they should have never gave me a permit for that well. Because we should have been hooked up to city water. Understand, and I'll tell you what, touch base with one of us afterwards here, and we'll do, from an Air Force perspective, confirm whether or not you should have been hooked up to municipal water supply in the past uh, due to that other uh, contamination that was there. If it is, there's something fell through the cracker there, we'll address it. Unfortunately, I, I can't answer the question about, you know, whether or not you issued a permit. There's probably somebody here from the county or whatever that issues the permits that we'd have to ask those questions of. Okay, I'm sorry, I just don't have enough information to immediately answer you. Are there any more questions? Yes, sir. I have one here, and this one you may be able to answer, because the uh, DEQ, the third slide from the end, uh, talked about two tasks that the Air Force has been tasked with, and one is operating groundwater extraction system to limit the migration of the contaminants, I guess the question bears, how long is that going to be? Or is there a value that you're looking at? And then the second bullet point was providing a final remedy for the contaminants. What can you maybe summarize would be the action plan that you have in place? Okay, I'll talk to the first question that he asked is, what are we, uh, how long will we operate some of these uh, treatment systems that, that were talked about in the DEQ slide. First of all, that extraction system that is in, that they refer to that's in place right now is related to the fish tissue. So that system, let's face it, that's probably there for a long time. Okay, and the Air Force will continue to operate that. And when- years, 20 years, what's, what's the window that, 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 we're, that we're looking at? Unfortunately, I can't tell you, but many times a system like that, you're talking well beyond 20 years. Okay, and and when what would be the criteria for turning it off? It would be once the Clark's Marsh had now that had been interrupted. That's returning there. You've got the fish tissue under control, and we no longer have. You know, we've we've either cleaned up the contamination or we've got the, some of the other things. It'd be a combination of the fish tissue down and you know, control of the contamination that's coming towards that extraction well. In, in terms of that, it said that uh, he asked about the letter in which the, uh, uh, were telling us that we need to go to a final remediation and clean up. Okay, I talked about that we were committed to doing the delineation and the other things. Right now, nobody knows what those final criteria are. And that's why I said we're pressing forward with making sure that we start capturing over the next couple, three years, all those wells, identify where that is, and continue to make sure that, that the contamination is, quote, not moving there or downstream that would impact public health. So that's what we're doing. And the final process is dependent upon an awful lot of things that go out there. But we're going to do everything that we can in an open and transparent way. This is one of those meetings where we're trying to be open and transparent. The, uh, we work with the regulatory agencies. They make sure that they're getting all our data, that they're seeing our conclusions, they're knowing what the plans are, and they're part of helping develop those plans. Thank you. One more, she says. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, excuse me for being late and could not find the church. <laughs> but um, I don't know the coverage, so apologies if you did. Where is the water traveling? We live on the other side of Manhattan Lake, off of Loud Drive. Is the water traveling that way? Or are you going to cover that if you are? I don't know that's a specific thing, but you're talking about does it travel to the other side of the lake? Correct. Right. Is the groundwater yeah. traveling across to, to the other side of the lake? 
In general, the answer is no. I think that's, that in general, that is, that having the DEQ, everybody here, this is one time you'll see all the agencies happen to go up and down, yes, together, okay? <laughs> One thing I would say that with regard to that, and maybe Bob Delaney might want to jump in, but there's been a lot of testing with regard to groundwater flow directions. And the direction of groundwater flow has been determined to flow from the other side of the lake into, into the lake. The lake. You know, and I saw re-enter the room. No, that's a, that's a really um, good question. And, and in any normal geologic situation, sorry, we're going to do a little science, that lake and that uh, stream of Manhattan <laughs> Creek and the Pine River would divide groundwater zones. In other words, under the, the circumstances here where you have a very shallow aquifer, there's not a lot of water in that upper aquifer, only 40 feet, and it comes to a big body of water, it tends to go into that stream. That's why the stream or the lake exists. It exists because the groundwater is going into it. You can get situations, especially out west, where a lake is actually putting water into the ground because the uh, river flows in and then the water goes down into the ground. But in Michigan, Invariably, when you get to a river, the water is going to flow into that, that lake or that river. Now, there is one complicating factor in this situation, and we discussed it today, and we're going to do some sampling on the other side of the lake, because you have a dam here. So what the dam has done, it has blocked the water that normally would flush through there. So what that means is that the water's piled up. It's gotten higher than the groundwater. And so in that area, down by the, the dam area, the, the lake water could push down into the ground. So if there is contamination of people's wells on the other side in, around the dam, it will be from the lake. And so we're going to go out and we're going to sample some of those wells. And obviously we're not going to stop sampling until we run out of the contamination, basically. And that's, what, that's how we'll do it. I don't know how long that will take. Um, but we know we're going to start right around that dam and see if there's some contamination right there. And then if, you know, if we find stuff, then we have to think about what we're going to do next. So I, I'm not sure if I... Go ahead. Well, our aquifer goes down 40 feet. Right. And our lake's only 20. Right. So we can see if we go underneath the lake to the other side. Um, we're talking groundwater, well yeah. water, and, you know, 20 foot lake, 40 foot aquifer. Uh, it, it, well, it's, you know, anything is possible in geology, I suppose. But uh, like I said, typically that wouldn't be the case. And, and when we see, especially with this ponded situation, though, we, we could conceive of it happening here. So we're going to go out and sample right around uh, those areas where it's most likely to have happened, which will be around the dam. So if it happens around the dam area, then we'll know, you know, we got we to look some more, okay? And so if you don't come up the lake and test, where is it that we want it to get it tested in our cell? Where is it to get it? Um, test America is the lab we use. There's quite a few labs, um, and we can get you the information on, on at least that lab and maybe another 
Air Force uses a different lab than we do. It's just very expensive, is the baby. Yeah, it's uh, five to seven hundred dollars. Say bye, I live right where the mouth of the river is, and over the years it has become extremely shallow and it is clogging in the mouth, restricting the flow of the river. Mm -hmm. It is widening behind it, just like rivers do when they start to clog. Wouldn't it be an easy solution to dredge that out, let the water flow freely, and open the dam a little bit more? Or, oh, you mean the, the dam? The Pine. The Pine River, which flows, which is your oh, source okay. of water, is becoming extremely restricted. Well, fortunately, it's, I can say to you, I know nothing about those kind of things, and I don't have any authority. It's hydrolysis. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I got, yes, it, it, I got, it, in, I got it in Geology 101, you know, about that yeah, stuff, but YouTube. honestly, yeah. <laughs> So we could probably change and exchange <laughs> notes, but I, I'm not, I, I'm sorry, that'd be a, a Corps of Engineers type question to, to ask them about stuff like that. I'm sorry. Well, we have a, a unit that does dams too in DEQ. Yeah? I have a question for the um, Air Force representative. Oh. Could you go back to him sure. if that's possible? That'd be great. Okay. <laughs> it's amazing how easily people give up microphones. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Recognize that the cost is not huge, and there's not, you know, right now that there is a, that there's only, you know, a couple handfuls of, of homes impacted. But it's not an issue of money; it's authorities to spend that money that that we're encumbered by. Okay. So what's different now? Where we're back in 1997. 1997, when we were doing that. There were definitive levels out there that we were trying to achieve, and so we had the authority to go forth and do that because we were exceeding those accepted levels out there. They were uh, regulatory criteria that said you should not be above this level, and that's the reason that, that we did what we did back then and had the authority to do it. Well, they are, but right now, we don't have any uh, levels above the provisional health advisory. That's that's where the dilemma is for the Air Force. I I don't go ahead. What they were telling me is that they want me to kind of cut off questions. We're going to have some more. I'm going to take your questions, sir, as the last question. But some Air Force people are going to present some more information, and there will be more questions allowed after um, time for more questions after that. If you want. My question has to do with, and uh, alluded to just now again, you said it's the follow the law, whatever the law is. Law. Correct. And you said that twice. Uh, the gentleman that asked that just left, but he is a uh, uh, state senator. Yes, I heard his introduction. Yes. Thanks. So you're saying if, if he were to be able to come up to the law and introduce one, and if it passed, you would follow a state law? When it comes to uh, state laws and federal laws with requirements on environmental things, there is a, a something called uh, ARARs, which is appropriate relevant rate laws and everything, that if they are in a state, then indeed we do follow those state requirements. That sounds, that sounds to me that sounds like a can of worms for you. 50 states, 50 different laws, you will follow them all. It, it does create, I guess, issues for us with some inconsistency across the country. Believe it or not, there's not that many times that there's major inconsistencies. There are different states on different pollutants that, that have different levels, but we are that that is the requirements and what we work with, and we do it. <laughs>